may be seated. Oh boy, oh boy, we got some good text today. <laughs> Done fornication. Wow, the geniuses who came up with the lectionary today really served us up a doozy. We have two short stories in 1 Samuel, Samuel and the Gospel of St. John about calling disciples. And neither of them are particularly uplifting. The Samuel story is really problematic because it ends with God pretty much being really mean to poor old Eli. The story from John isn't that bad, but it's a little dry. But then, oh boy, oh boy, we really got one coming out of the left field with the epistles. St. Paul writing to all those bothersome Corinthians all about the loaded topic of fornication. While I firmly believe there's good news in all these readings, my sisters and brothers, they definitely all take a great deal of unpacking to get there, and given that we probably need a little something to warm us up on such a cold winter's morning, let's just stick with the porn. <laughs> I figure it's probably been a couple months since I've gotten too controversial in one of my sermons, so you know, let's get <laughs> So first of all, has anyone here ever heard of the houses of Hillel and Shammai? Anyone ever heard of that kind of the... I don't blame you. Um, although I had heard a bit about Hillel because most uh, uh, Jewish, student, Jewish student union centers on college campuses are named after him. I hadn't really heard this entire story myself until I got to the seminary of Hillel and Shema. Uh, so don't worry about not knowing it. That said, though, it might be a little bit too history nerdish, but try to remember about Hillel and Shema. Because this story can definitely, their story can definitely go a long way in helping us figure out uh, difficult eth ethical issues and sort through difficult biblical passages as Christians. Just like this one about all that morning. It's a bit of an oversimplification of their story, but essentially, Hillel and Shammai were two competing Jewish sages who lived not that long before the time of Christ. Now, when these sages disagree about important matters of Torah or Jewish law, they and their respective followers, and the people that followed after them, tended to hold to one of two competing schools of thought. The Shammai folks generally tried to stick more to the letter of the law, to do things exactly by the book. While the Hillel folks tended to spend a bit more time thinking about the context, their own context, the context of the author of, of, of the book and the Torah, and how a particular piece of Torah should be applied, the sort of spirit and intent behind what the writer, what was written in the book. What was the spirit and intent behind what was written? The most famous practical example of Halal and Shammai's perspectives on Torah um, is a bit of an argument they got over, they got in about white lies, sort of innocent lies. Now, according to the last part of Leviticus 19:11, I'm sure everyone knows that one. You're not supposed to lie. It literally says, "You shall not lie to one another." But what happens, and this is literally the exact example Hillel and Shammai brought up, what happens if on her wedding day, a not particularly attractive bride asks you if she looks beautiful? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> yep, they, this is literally a big historical argument. Should you lie, be nice, and say she's beautiful, or should you follow the law exactly and truthfully say, have a blessed wedding day, darling, but no, you are ugly. <laughs> <laughs> now, the right course of action, I think, seems obvious to all of us, but the Shammai folks would disagree. Tell her she's ugly, they said, they'd say. Stick to the law. Now, the law folks uh, wouldn't say the law isn't helpful here, but rather they would say that in order to give proper respect to the law, think about it a little bit. Consider really what Leviticus 19.11 is trying to get at. What's really the intent behind that writing? It's sort of for people to respect each other, not to call 
call each other ugly. I'm going to wedding day. What's the spirit behind the law, behind the text? In the end, Hillel famously uh, said, every, every bride is beautiful on her own. And I think he's right. Does anyone disagree? Wait. <laughs> <laughs> During Christ's time, actually, the Shammai folks were more popular. As opposition to Roman domination grew, uh, the more hardline approach of the Shammai folks was more appealing to people. Eventually, though, taking the Shammai approach to foreign policy with the Roman Empire didn't work out too well. And it's partially what led to Jerusalem and particularly the temple to be destroyed around 70 AD. As Jewish leaders uh, reconstituted themselves in succeeding years, though, Shammai's way of looking at things was largely thrown out. Uh, you, know, you must, it, it became pretty apparent that you must take into account one's context when interpreting scripture. The spirit of the law is what truly matters. In the end, Lel's approach largely triumphed and grew into the majorly influencing the beautiful faith of Judaism as we know today. And really influenced Christianity too, by the way. Many people would say that uh, Jesus read the law in a similar way to Hillel. When you see these controversial, difficult biblical passages, my sisters and brothers, whether they be the Old Testament or the New Testament, remember this whole Hillel Shammai thing. Prayerfully try to discern in the spirit of the what the spirit of the author's writing is. And indeed, how the Holy Spirit is currently at work in, in that text right now, in this day of the 21st century synecdoche, or uh, wherever you might be at the time. Now, when thinking all about this fornicating business, and indeed all the other various types of sexually related sins listed around it in 1 Corinthians, really, the whole laundry list, they, they cut out the, the whole laundry list, it's like the verse right before where we started reading today. Let's keep our context in mind in these situations. As Christians, we're all members of a religious movement that hasn't exactly gotten matters of gender and sexuality exactly right over the years. All the women kept out of the pulpit simply because of their gender. All the folks told to stay in horribly abusive relationships by their local pastor or priest. All the recent divorcees who, in the midst of a crisis at the time when they maybe most needed their support of their faith communities the most, that, you know, those folks being shamed out of their churches. Now, I imagine we may have different views in the congregation related to marriage equality, LGBT issues, and that sort of thing. But wow, I hope, though, that we can all agree that things like what that happened this past week, and maybe you heard about it, church over in Colorado. Uh, they decided to cancel a young woman's funeral 15 minutes into the funeral uh, because the pastor found out she was gay. Yeah. I hope we could all agree that things like that are far less than I knew, and certainly not reflective of Christian love. Unfortunately, although many of the congregations in our denomination and others have been improving in recent years, it's our history as Christians and notable news stories like the one out of Colorado this past week that have made so many folks, and not just people from my generation, uh, associate Christianity and Christians not with God or love or Jesus, but simply with being uppity and mean about matters relating to sexuality. I've seen it with my own eyes a bunch of times. Christians talking all about how they're, they're pure, but in the end, pretty much just putting themselves over someone else by shaming people who wouldn't fit their standards of purity. These sort of actions, these sort of shaming that takes place all too often in Christian circles in matters related to human sexuality is in the end completely hogwash, needs to be called as such for two reasons. First, when we put ourselves over and above someone else, whether or not that person is doing something sinful, it doesn't matter, when we put ourselves over and above someone else, it's all too easy for us to forget about the things in our own lives that need improvement. Second, though, and even more importantly, we end up kind of looking like Shema, calling someone ugly on their wedding day. Paul wrote all this business about not fornicating to a church in the first century that was rife with conflict. The text seems to suggest people were committing all sorts of acts of 
crazy sexual crazy, all sorts of craziness, because they thought they were freed by forgiveness in Christ to do whatever they pleased. And as would obviously happen, the Corinthians just ended up hurting each other quite horribly. They were messing up the relationships with God and with one another, and uh, you know, misusing the gift of human sexuality often does that. If you take the Hillel approach, though, and look at the spirit of what Paul is trying to say to the Corinthians, and you can finally start finding good news here by doing so. You can see that in our day and age, in a time when the church has messed up issues uh, related to human sexuality for so long, and so many people have been hurt, and so many people feel unwelcome in Christian communities because of it, it's not usually sexuality that's getting in the way of being in a relationship with God and one another. But rather the overzealous judgment and shaming that is, in fact, a more common problem. That's not to say we should go out and be like the Corinthians and do whatever we want. Not at all. As we've seen, you know, with all the clergy sexual abuse stuff, for instance, over the years, that's really messed up some relationships, too. We need to take sexuality seriously. But wow, in our contemporary context, at least in Christianity as a whole, that overzealous judgment and shaming is more often than not what's really get what's really what is really hurting folks and get in the way of far too many folks uh, knowing the joy of Christian community that we all share. When you look at the spirit of what Paul's trying to say with all this warning, fornicating stuff, in the end, Paul is saying, take Christ seriously. Take Christ seriously. Outside of gathering to hear the scriptures publicly read, being baptized, celebrating communion, all things that involve lots of other people in community, by the way, the best way we can know Christ in this world is simply by seeing him in the face of other people. Oftentimes in the face of people we would not expect Christ to be, where we would expect Christ to be. Christ is breaking into all your lives each and every day. Take that seriously. If you're part of a community uh, where sexuality is, in fact, getting in the way of seeing Christ in one another like it was in first century Corinth, sure, tamper that down a bit. If you're part of a community where judgment and shaming is getting in the way of seeing Christ in one another, as it certainly was in a lot of today's churches, and I'm not saying here, but in a lot of today's churches, chill out a bit with all the judgment and shaming. Christ, my sisters and brothers, is constantly trying to break into each and every one of our lives to heal us, to save us, to liberate us, to make sure that we know we are loved, no matter what. Christ is trying to teach us something, too, by sometimes showing up in the faces of people uh, where we would least expect it. And indeed, Christ has promised to do these things. And yes, our God in Christ is a God 